I'm reading Answer to Job by C.G. Young, paragraph 635. The book of Job still rings with the proud joy of creating when Yahweh points to the huge animals he has successfully turned out. Behold, behemoth, which I made as I made you. He is first of the works of God, made to be Lord over his companions. Job 40, 15, and 19. Paragraphs 636 and 637. So even in Job's day, Yahweh is still intoxicated with the tremendous power and grandeur of his creation. Compared with this, what are Satan's pinpricks and the lamentations of human beings who were created with the behemoth, even if they bear God's image? Yahweh seems to have forgotten this fact entirely. Otherwise, he would never have ridden so roughshod over Job's human dignity. Paragraph 637. It is only the careful and farsighted preparations for Christ's birth which show us that omniscience has begun to have a noticeable effect on Yahweh's actions. A certain philanthropic and universalistic tendency makes itself felt. The children of Israel take something of a second place in comparison with the children of men. After Job, we hear nothing further about new covenants. Proverbs and gnomic utterances seem to be the order of the day, and a real novum now appears on the scene, namely apocalyptic communications. This points to metaphysical acts of cognition, that is, to constellated unconscious contents which are ready to erupt into consciousness. In all this, as we have said, we discern the helpful hand of Sophia. Paragraph 638. To consider Yahweh's behavior up to the reappearance of Sophia as a whole, one indubitable fact strikes us. The fact that his actions are accompanied by an inferior consciousness. Paragraph 638. To consider Yahweh's behavior up to the reappearance of Sophia as a whole, one indubitable fact strikes us. The fact that his actions are accompanied by an inferior consciousness. Time and again we miss reflection and regard for absolute knowledge. His consciousness seems to be not much more than a primitive awareness which knows no reflection and no morality. One merely perceives and acts blindly, without conscious inclusion of the subject, whose individual existence raises no problems. Today we would call such a state psychologically unconscious, and in the eyes of the law it would be described as non compass mentis. The fact that consciousness does not perform acts of thinking does not, however, prove that they do not exist, they merely occur unconsciously and make themselves felt indirectly in dreams, visions, revelations, and instinctive changes of consciousness, whose very nature tells us that they derive from an unconscious knowledge and are the result of unconscious acts of judgment or unconscious conclusions.